So last Sunday, uh, we introduced our series, and I know we were online only. Um, if you were not able to join us online, um, I encourage you to go, go <laughs> online to our website. Check that, go check out our first. We're talking about 21 days of prayer and fasting. And prayer and fasting, the two are two spiritual, specific spiritual disciplines we find in Scripture. And uh, if you were not able to watch that introduction, I, 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 I don't say this often, but two things that, were, that I was messaged this week that just really touched, that really spoke to me, is I had two different people from our church say, I used to be intimidated by prayer and fasting, but you made it so easy to just, like it was always something that was intimidating and, and hearing how approachable it was. And those, that's just, uh, prayer and fasting is tough. Now, I'm going to do a brief rundown for what we talked about before we dive in this morning. And we define prayer as simply taking deliberate and intentional steps to communicate with God regularly and with purpose. Fasting, abstaining from food, media, entertainment, anything else that occupies our time to focus on God. Prayer and fasting leads us, right, to physically withdraw from something, a season, a time, a meal, a location, taking time to physically withdraw to prepare us for spiritual transformation, preparing us to humbly sit at the feet of Jesus. Now, we kicked off this 21 days of prayer and fasting this past Monday, and uh, I don't know about you, if you have been following along online, I've been so encouraged um, by the posts and the comments um, and what you guys are praying for, what you're pr fasting from. It's been encouraging, and uh, I'm fasting sweets, and it's killing me. Not going to lie. Our kids have asked for ice cream more this week than I think they ever have before. And if you know me, ice cream is like the weakness I can't say no to. It's like, oh, it, it kills me. And so, but we're doing it together. So reading how you guys are, what you guys are fasting and how you're, man, that's even brought like so much more encouragement to me. We're doing it together. Why are we doing it together? Because we're going to be more successful with accountability. A group with a common goal with healthy accountability will make a difference. You got that? A, common, a group with a common goal with healthy accountability, we're going to make a difference. So simply, what is our goal? You ready? I know this is simple, but it is. Our goal is to grow closer to God by knowing God more. Now you can't tell me here you're exempt from knowing God more. To, be, to know God more, we've got to live like Christ on a daily basis. And it happens with spiritual discipline. Now, a new year, a new me, can't be new if I stay the same. A new year and a new me can't be new if I stay the same. But it is a new year and a new me, but it is the same Jesus that leads us. To know God more is to be more like Christ. So Jesus prayed, so we pray. Jesus fasted, so we fast. Jesus sought out solitude, so we seek out solitude. Jesus worshiped, so we worship. Jesus served, so we serve. Very simply, we can't be Jesus, but we sure can live like Jesus. So this morning, we're going to go all in and we're going to dive all in on fasting. Now, I'm going to be transparent. If you've been around Anchor for any length of time, you understand. I only know one way of speaking, and that's being transparent, honest, and vulnerable. And some of you are probably like, you, Pastor Alex, you say too much sometimes. Yeah, I know my family says that all the time. And, uh, but this is the hardest spiritual discipline for me. Fasting, I, and, and I wish I could put my fingers on exactly why, but there is just something that's challenging. Like I, when I can't have something, I'm one of those guys that's wired that I'm going to go after it all that much harder. You tell me I can't do something, please tell me I can't do something. Like I, it's like, it's like now, now my motive and my goal is just to prove you wrong. And so that's probably somewhere in there in the mix is why is tell me I can't have something. Like, I mean, I, God forbid somebody tell me to fast steaks or beef. I'm going to be in real trouble. Now, I remember the first time I, I, I felt the leading to fast. I was a teenager. I was, a, I was an eighth grader, okay? You know, eighth grade, you know, I mean, I, I, right? Eighth graders, God love them. Middle school students, oh, Jesus help us all. Now, I was young. Pseudo naive. I really lacked a proper understanding of what fasting was, so I went into this feeling to fast very underprepared. Have you ever felt like you're underprepared in something? Right? All the time? And so I'm arrogant. I was arrogantly at eight, in the eighth grade, like I walked out of youth group one night and I was like, I'm going to fast music. <laughs> now, the problem was, true story, I, I love music, I enjoy music. Uh, 
Uh, and, and to be quite honest, I listen to a lot of music in my bedroom that I wouldn't even approve of my kids listening to now. And uh, now I, for Christmas that year, got a six disc CD changer with big speakers. Let's roll. Come on. That meant I could put my worship CD in disc one, the CD of the things I didn't want my parents lit, knowing I listened to in disc two. I had a remote control that I could change it at the push of a button. Come on. Some of you are like, this dude's nuts. Now we try to buy speakers that can be the smallest speaker that can fill the biggest room. Back then, if you had big speakers, you know what I'm talking about? Like, remember those like TV speakers that were like six foot tall? And it was like, dude, this dude knows what he's... I mean, you know... You know what I'm talking about? Now it's like, give me a sound bar. Six disc CD changer. Man, that was legendary back then. I mean, I, and some of you are like, man, you know what? That, that was me. I wanted one of those. Like, my mom and dad never was that cool. Neither were mine. My grandparents were the ones that were cool. <laughs> then some of you are sitting here going, you're probably like, man, Pastor Alex, you're old. I've got this phone. And I've got this thing called Spotify. My parents pay my subscription. And I can go on at the push of a button and I get the entire music library, except for Garth Brooks, of course. And it's real frustrating that I have to go to Amazon Music to listen to Garth Brooks. And some of you are like, my pastor listens to Garth Brooks. Yes, I've seen him live twice, three times. Yeah. Right? I'm talking, you know what I'm talking about? Now here's the, but, but here's what you youngins don't understand. You don't understand the struggle of a scratch disc. There is no coming back from scratch discs. You could take it to Blockbuster all you want, because yes, Blockbuster had a disc cleaner. They thought they could. Some of you are like, Blockbuster? Go to Netflix and you'll figure it out. <laughs> In my generation, I'm gonna put, I hope you put this together, my generation of a scratch disc is the same as your generation of my Wi-Fi's down. <laughs> the end result was the same. No music. Disappointment. Now, what I love about music and it's really two specific principles. And uh, what I love about music is, number one, it evokes emotion. You ever felt like when you, when you, when you, uh, just, it, you just feel it. So many times in life we just get, our, we, we, we get told not to feel things. And when you put music and you put your earbuds in or you listen to worship, you just, and if you don't feel it, you need to engage because music evokes emotion. The other thing I love about it is it recalls memories. There's nothing like hearing a song that was a specific time that you want to remember. That song can bring you right back there. The times in my life when I can remember that, I, that, that were really transformational for me. What was said, talking, but I can't tell you what music was playing. I can tell you right now, my, both my grandparents' funeral, I can tell you what music played during the funeral. If that song comes on my, turns on my playlist, I promise you, it's going to evoke emotion inside of me because it's going to take me right back there. That's what music does. That's why worship is so important. Because emotional, right? Going after God together. I love music. Yeah, I'm a drummer by heart. Some of you are like, I didn't know my, I didn't know my pastor drummed. Yeah. I don't drum as much as, as I used to. Um, I was the, always the guy growing up that that uh, would play on the youth worship team, would be on the church worship. I mean, I would, we would practice once a week, and we have to be there three hours early on Sunday because, you know, it, it's just, you got to get set. I, I love drumming. And, and the reality is, you know, ever since, like, God has moved me into pastoring, I don't drum near as often. And, um, and Nate likes to coin me the pocket drummer because that's what I love. I love being, and, and for some of you are going to go Google what a pocket drummer is. Please do. You'll see it. And, and, you, and the thing is, is what I've learned about things like drumming for me is you can take the drumsticks out of my hands and yeah, God has to the largest extent because there's seasons when God's going to gift you to do what he's called you to do and then he's going to call you to lay those drumsticks down and move into the next season and if you haven't been in prayer and fasting you're going to get really hurt when he tells you to lay the drumsticks down but the funny thing is and you can ask my wife and you can ask my kids you can take the drumsticks out of my hands but you don't get to take my thumbs you know what I'm talking about? Sean's like, I know it's when that beat comes on and you're sitting at a table. I got really big thumb nut, whatever these things are, knuckles, I don't know what they're called. Right? You can take the drumsticks out of my hand, but man, when you get a song, you see, I'm a self taught drummer. I've never had one professional lesson in my life. 
So every way I learned how to drum was with a CD and headphones on, listening to worship music, listening to country music, trying to get as many styles as I can because I wanted to grow in my craft. So here's this teenager who felt that God was asking him to fast music. No music meant no drumming. And the problem with that, very simply, was not only was I really a part of the church as a drummer, I was a first chair percussionist in the eighth grade band. Oh yeah, I played the bells real well. <laughs> and we have band class every day. And I know that, uh, you know, these new cool, whatever, the ways they do school with block scheduling, you don't always have the same class every day. I'm from the age where you had eight classes and you had them five days a week, right? Anybody with me? Yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't like put off math for 48 hours because you had math, you had your math teacher, whether you liked him or her or not. You had it every day, you had to deal with it. We had band class every day and so I was around music every day, and, and, uh, and so I was sitting here thinking through and, you know, walking out of youth, and I was like, well, how am I going to get out of band class? And then it hit me. I'll just go tell my band teacher that God called me to fast, and he'll exempt me from playing music. And the reality is we view fasting the same way. If I just withdraw, no matter if it's necessary or not, if I withdraw from the necessary things, and then I'm going to wonder... Why I don't succeed. You think that band teacher was going to say yes? Yeah, right. If only you knew my eighth grade band teacher. You know he didn't say yes to anything. I never did have the courage to talk to him and tell him what God left me, what God called me to do. And I can't even imagine what my band teacher would have said to me. Probably would have laughed. Probably would have been out like, hey, what is fasting? It's probably he'd probably give you the same kind of response if you go up to your teacher tomorrow. Go up to your parents tomorrow and go, I think God is calling me to fast my school attendance this week. Or maybe if you go up to your boss and say, well, I think I'm, you know, God has called me to fast my expectations and my duties. So I'm just, no, just going to stay home. But I bet you'd probably be a little offended when your boss looks at you and says, well, I think I'm going to fast your paying your salary this week too. Choosing what to fast, in my opinion, I'm not going to tell you this is fact for everybody, but for me, choosing what to fast is the hardest part about being obedient in fasting. As a teenager, I chose music, which at the time was almost impossible to avoid, but I truthfully thought I could. So what happened? I didn't even make it through the first day. I didn't make it through the first day because the things that I had in commitments that were healthy were going to be affected by that. Meaning school and church, I couldn't avoid that. But it was all geared in this one very simple fact is I had a misinterpretation of what fasting was. And just because I, had a, I had, didn't have a correct interpretation on what fasting was doesn't remove the necessity for me to fast. Why? Because Jesus fasted. Jesus fasted, so we fast. And today we're going to be in the book of Matthew. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Matthew, be in chapter 4. If you don't have your Bibles, grab that device, download the Bible app if you would rather not use your device. Uh, bring your Bibles every Sunday, but you can look up on the screens. We'll have it on. If you want, if you would, stand with me this morning as we read God's Word. Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. During that time the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. Verse 8, next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, said, I will give it, to you, give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Now, if you have a pen at your seat, you should. I want you, if you have your Bibles, I want you to highlight this. I want you to circle this, square, whatever you got to do. These very five words. Get out of here, Satan. Get out of here. For the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil went away and the angels came and took care of Jesus. Today, God, help us know you just a little bit more. But God, as we are diving into fasting, 
But God, we keep our eyes and our focus directly on you. So that when temptation comes, just like Jesus faced multiple times, we can look Satan in the eye and say, get out of here. But God, we may have walked in with apprehensions about prayer and fasting. We may have walked in a little anxious about this. But God, we're going to walk out excited because you're going to do a new thing. As we grow closer to you, as we live more like your son Jesus, we're going to know you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing in honor of God's word. Jesus fasted, so we fast. Now there is one central theme that I want us all to take away from this passage of Scripture, and it is incredibly simplistic, is fasting teaches us to be dependent upon God. That's what fasting does. Jesus here led to the wilderness, and, and I have to imagine that when the Holy Spirit led Jesus to the wilderness, I have to imagine that Jesus didn't quite know what exactly was in the wilderness for him. I'd have to imagine that he was walking into the wilderness like, why am I doing this? What is necessary? See, Jesus was led there by the Holy Spirit, but I have to picture that he didn't expect it to last 40 days and 40 nights. Most of us live in the wilderness and we don't even realize it. We've been there so long, it's become comfortable. We don't know what life outside of the wilderness looks like. Because it's been so long since we did. We aimlessly wander and we're relying upon ourselves for guidance. You see, 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness doesn't seem like that long if you've been in it for decades. Jesus being led to that wilderness, he willingly obeyed. That's tough for me to that's tough for me to process. That's tough for me to picture. You know, if I were led to a dark and stormy place a dark and stormy season, I wish I could say with confidence I would obey. See, most of us, we would obey when we know sunshine and beaches or mountains and snow are on the horizon. You know what I'm talking about when you're driving west? You get past Goodland and you're on I-70 and you get into Lyman and you start to see the tips of the mountains and it's like, oh, you made the... Because the truth is, from Salina to Denver, it looks just about the same. It's amazing what we're willing to do when we think beaches and sunshine and snow and mountains are on the horizon. But what if it was a dark wilderness or a dry desert? Would you willingly go? Jesus did. It's a different story. So the question we have to ask ourselves then is, what is going to prepare us for the dark wilderness and the dry deserts? And we read it right here in verse 2. It's very simple. For 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus fasted and became hungry. Fasting prepares us for the seasons when temptation could overwhelm us. Fasting is preparation to be ready for whatever may lie ahead. It took Jesus 40 days to be ready. Now, can you imagine 40 days without Chick-fil-A? Our kids had Chick-fil-A last night. I didn't, because I'm doing keto, and so I can't eat Chick-fil-A. So not only am I fasting sweets, I'm doing keto, and it is absolutely driving me insane. But you may be like, well, Pastor Alex, the Lord wouldn't ask me to fast his chicken, would he? I mean, you know, this is a true story, ready? True story. You know, if you really want to see Peter at the pearly gates of heaven, you know you first have to pass through the drive through of the heavenly Chick-fil-A, right? You know, heaven's Chick-fil-A, I mean, you got, that's... That's the road to get to heaven. Some of you are going to get that later. Sidebar, I think Popeye's is better. So we're going to keep moving. <laughs> Jesus fasted, so we fast. It's true. It's crispier, tastes better, and you get a biscuit. <laughs> Let's talk about what's important, yes. I just caused turmoil in some of your lives. You're going to have to go pray. Somebody's, people online are commenting now that it's like they're going to boycott the church and we're going to just hope and pray chick fil A's open after church. FYI, it won't be. Okay? Jesus spent 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. Spent 40 days and 40 nights in temptation. 40 days and 40 nights hungry. But Jesus prevailed. Think about this for a moment. Jesus prevailed. And it wasn't because he was both God and man. Jesus prevailed because he had fully depended upon God. He knew where his provision came from. He knew where his sustenance came from. It wasn't Chick-fil-A. It wasn't Popeye's. It wasn't McDonald's. God help your soul. And you know what? It was 
God. Oh, there's a lot wrong. A lot wrong. And that's what fasting simply is. It is a dependence on God. Now, fasting, very simple. Let me give you a little history, right? Because I want you, I want this to be an understanding so we get what fasting is. Fasting is a spiritual discipline that has spanned generations. It has crossed religious backgrounds of all kinds, and it has crossed cultural boundaries. This is an ancient form of discipline that goes back as long as man was created. And it's very simple. Why is this so important? And it's very simply this. Fasting reveals the areas of our life that control us. What in my life do I depend on more than God? Now, some of you don't know this, but uh, um, the messages that we give on Sunday mornings go through many layers of edits. It's not just what one person feels. You know, we, this is weeks and weeks of preparation. And the last layer of my messages, it flows through the eyes of Pastor Luke. So if you don't like what I say, it's really his fault. And, um, but as one of the things that, that uh, working with Pastor Luke side by side now for just a shade under two years is I know how much he loves his caffeine. And uh, he is an avid sweet tea drinker, and, uh, and God led him to fast caffeine through this. And, um, and so this week, I will attest that Monday morning at 8.30 when we meet to start the new work week, he had no caffeine, but he did have a bottle of ibuprofen. So, but it was interesting because as he was, as he was reading the message and he was writing some notes down, as just a way to really, because we want to take our everything we do. We don't want to get stuck in good. We want to take it to great. And this is one of the ways we can take it to great. He put this, he asked this simple thing. He goes, he said this, after reading through the message, this helps me understand my fast and see my fast from caffeine in a different light. What is my true source of energy? What is my true source of energy? Fasting reveals the areas of our life that control us. For you and for me, it may be food, it may be social media, it may be TikTok, it may be TV, music, an app on our phone, eating out at restaurants. What controls my life? What in my life do I believe I can't live without that is unnecessary? God is not going to call you to, va- to fast your job. God is not going to call you to fast church attendance. God's not going to call you to fast life group attendance, right? God's not going to call you to fast things that, like worship that are, good, that are intended for you to grow spiritually. Now, last week I, asked, I encouraged everyone watching online, I encouraged you guys to ask yourselves this question. What thing gets more of my attention than God that is unnecessary? Another way to put it may be this. What has become an obsession in my life? You see, it's amazing how obsessive we get over things like TV shows or a certain restaurant, a certain food place. Right? We get obsessive. We get obsessive in relationships and we only want to spend time with one specific person and then we wonder why that person is overwhelmed and starts withdrawing from us. We get obsessive. Too much of anything besides our faith and growing in our faith is unhealthy. And this is something that I, I've been amazed by even in the last week. It's because fasting is going to teach us more than we expect if we embark on that journey with pure motives. You can learn. I've yet to meet anybody in life who was exempt from learning. Because you know what they're learning? If they're by not learning, is they're learning how not to do things. You know, technology can be your best friend, but it can also be your worst enemy. But if we don't take time to learn how to use technology to its best for us, I read a study recently that said uh, the generation, those of us that are in our late 20s to early 40s, is, is, is going to be the most productive generation in mankind history because we, come, we, we have parents and grandparents who know the value in doing work with your hands, and yet we know how to use technology as a way to make the work with our hands just a little bit quicker. Whereas the generation before us, Refuse to use technology, and the generation after us, meaning those of you who are t- late 20s and below, don't want to do anything but, but use technology. Now, whether that's true or not, I haven't researched that, but it sure is an interesting concept. We're all learning. Fasting will reveal what controls us. Fasting will reveal what is unnecessary and what has become an obsession. Anything that we fast from, something that we have become dependent on, We are practicing the difficult art of saying no 
in order so we can more faithfully say yes to God. You know how you have to practice that? You don't just get there. You don't just show up one day and start saying yes to God. It's something you have to practice over and over and over again. What do you need in your life? Physical healing? Restorations of some relationships? Renewal of your friendships and community? You live in a rough neighborhood that just needs rejuvenated? Freedom from addiction? A fresh word from the Lord? Direction? Vision? A renewing and transformation of your mind? Reconciliation of your heart? You see, these are all great motives to start a fast. These are great motives to start a fast. Because the reality says fasting will be brutal if we approach it with impure motives. Now I want to get something very, very, very clear. There is a difference between brutal and uncomfortable. Those two words are not synonymous. Just because it's uncomfortable. Just because like crazy, I wish I could leave church today and go to Silas and Maddie's and get a double scoop of chocolate chip cookie dough ice cream doesn't make my fast brutal. There is a difference between brutal and uncomfortable. And this is how we approach fasting. It's almost like it becomes a punishment. It's like, oh, I mean, God's punishing me, so I've got to fast. We make statements like that subconsciously. And then we wonder why we don't succeed. Friends, fasting is not a punishment. Fasting is preparation. And if I'm fasting something, and I, this is just a little sidebar, if I'm fasting something that I don't physically or emotionally notice is missing, then I'm not fasting. Let me say that again. If I'm fasting something that I don't physically or emotionally notice is missing, you're not fasting. It's important to note there's a reason why we're doing this series with prayer and fasting together because they go hand in hand. If we remove prayer from our fasting, then we're not fasting. Really what we're doing is just simply dieting and depriving ourselves of things. We have to understand that we're fasting to make room to seek God with greater urgency. We're making room. It's not about healthy eating. It's not about watching less TV. It's not about texting on your phone less or Snapchatting less. It's all about knowing God more. When we pray, you see, we pray when we normally would have had that meal. We pray when we normally would have engaged that TV show. We pray when we normally would have been on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or whatever it is. And when we pray, we're communicating. And it all goes back to our goal, right? What's our goal? To go closer to God by knowing God more. And if all I'm doing is fasting from something and, and I don't have, like, I'll, I'll, and I'm not going to pray, then something else is going to take up that time and it's not going to be God because you're going to give it to something else. Your house isn't going to be clean enough. Your job is always going to have another expectation. You're going to force yourself to work more. Your kids are always going to need to go somewhere else. If I don't specifically pray during the time that I'm fasting, we're not communicating with God. Fasting gives us more time for prayer is more time for communication, which is more time for relational growth. Prayer breaks down walls. Prayer overcomes obstacles. And we're going to dive into this a lot more next week. Breaks down walls, overcomes obstacles. It will bring spiritual breakthrough. It will destroy our sin. It will restore relationships. It will bring clarity to the answers we seek from God. See, fasting helps us put intention and effort into our prayer life. But we have to have a purpose. We've got to have a plan. Truth is, without a purpose and a plan to our fasting and our prayer, we're most likely going to quit. We have to know the why behind why we're fasting. We have to know the plan of what's going to happen during our fast. You see, when I was a teenager, I didn't plan well for what I was committing to. I didn't plan well. So many of us fail to plan, so what do we do? Plan to fail. Start small. Don't be afraid to start small. See, friends, I don't encourage you tomorrow to start a 40-day meal fast. Now, I have an uncle who every year, to start the year, will do a 40-day meal fast. Every year. Has for most of my life. I don't know about you, but that seems awful daunting, even to me. So I sat down with him one time and I said, I, I just want to know, how do you do it? 
And I was expecting some long list spiritual answer of, you know, I was in a prayer club. You know, I mean, you know what I'm talking about? You expect this long list. And he said, Alex, it's really simple. It's two things. Number one, God told me to do it. That, that should be enough right there, right? But unfortunately, we humans, we need, we need more justification. And he said, number two, I started small. He's like, the first year, I fasted one full day. The second year, I fasted two full days. And third year, I went up to five days. And then I went to 10 days. He goes, I didn't start with day, I didn't start with 40 days. Now to you, and maybe to me, this seems like a pretty simple, simplistic plan, right? Like, well, okay, well, I, man, that, I can't do 40 days, but I can do one. Some of the most simple plans become the most effective because we just stop overthinking it. Now let's be honest, if we felt God leading us, let's be truthful, right? If we felt God leading us to fast, a fast food, for 40 days, most of us would immediately jump off the cliff and go all in without any level of preparation. We would cold turkey flip it upside down. And then about halfway through day two, when those hunger pains start kicking in, we would deem ourselves failures and then we would quit. And it's not that our motives were wrong. It's not that our intentions were impure. It's all wrapped up in our poor preparation and planning. For a teenager who had great intentions, I had a horrible plan. I couldn't fast music. My GPA and my classmates needed me to be all in. The church needed me behind a drum set. And as I look back, it wasn't the music that God was asking from me. It was simply my heart. His desire was more of me, more of my attention. And it came down to this very simple principle. You ready for this? He wanted to know I loved him more than I loved the drums. Fasting and praying forces us to place our attention where it matters most, on God. He wanted my attention. God wants your attention. See, last week we told the story of Mary and Martha. Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus while Martha is cooking and preparing a meal. And Martha is like, man, Jesus, just tell him. Just tell him, Mary to come help me. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus and her attention was solely on him, not on what was going around. Jesus was stranded in the wilderness, being tempted, but his attention was solely on God. They both knew the importance and necessity of focusing on God and depending on God. We've got to prepare well. We've got to plan well. We've got to pray well. So how do I put this into practice? And if you watched live online, this is going to seem like just like what we talked about last week, and it is, and we're going to talk about it again next week. Fasting is abstaining from food, media, and entertainment or anything else that occupies my time so that I can focus on God. We're in the middle as a church of a 21-day prayer and fast. Posts are coming out every day. People are engaging. And there's four simple action steps I want you to take. Because I want you to join us. You may be like, well, I'm a week late. No, you're right on time. Number one, follow us on social media. Commit to check Facebook or Instagram every day in the stories for daily reminders and inspiration. Drop a comment. Say so, Do something. Each day there's going to be posts, and they're usually posted right around 7 a.m. to be reminded and inspired to keep going. Number two, choose something you're going to fast for the next 14 days. Choose something that you'll fast. Asking ourselves, what thing gets more of my attention than God that is unnecessary? What has become an obsession in my life? See, we're 14 days into our 21 days of prayer and fasting. Don't just disregard this because you didn't start with the rest of us. Right? We're not any far ahead of you. We just started a little bit sooner, and that's okay. Jump in today. Number three, set aside time each day for reading the Bible and praying. Each day we have posts coming out with specific scripture and it's been amazing to see how that scripture is affecting people's life in the moment. Also a post that comes out along the same time to help guide your prayer life. See, the prayer is not intimidating. If you prayed through the entire list, it would take you less than 90 seconds. Maybe you say, well, that's, that's it for now. This is where God starts small. Don't be afraid to start small. Then number four, join us next Sunday morning as we collectively seek the Lord together through prayer, worship, and those words. Don't miss a Sunday. 
Because what God does in this building every Sunday is a direct result of what God has done in you Monday through Saturday. If you come in Sunday and you're discouraged, if you come in Sunday and you're lonely and isolated and frustrated and overwhelmed by work, God can overcome that. But God wants to overcome that during the week, not just on Sunday. Because God's presence, God wants His presence going with us. And that will happen when it's within us. God's power will go with us when it happens within us. We do this together so that we together as a church grow closer to God by knowing Him more. So as we start this year, commit with me. We're going to put God first. Commit with me. We're putting God first. Above all, before all. Our first priority. I'm going to ask you all to stand. I'm going to ask you to commit to this with me. That this year, I'm making my faith, I'm making my Savior, and my spiritual growth my first priority with no compromise. It's one thing to do it and say, well, but until here, or until this takes place. Life happens, right? Life happens. Work happens. Things happen. The beauty of how the technological age works is you can still grow. But it takes commitment. I'm going to make God my first priority without compromise. Today, God, we make you our first priority. God, I'm done putting other things before you. God, I'm making you, I'm keeping my eyes focused on you. If you call me to fast, I will fast. If you call me to pray, I will pray. God, I'm going to have faith and believe that you're going to move the mountains in my life. I'm going to pray and believe that you're going to help me cross every endless ocean. That God, if I approach the wilderness, I am going to do it knowing I have confidence and I'm prepared because I've spent time with you. Jesus couldn't have faced temptation with Satan without spending time with you. Mary couldn't have faced the pressures of a sister who was trying to get her to compromise what she knew was right had she not sat at your feet and spent time in your presence. Give us the courage and confidence to stop for a moment and disregard the biggest lie the enemy gives us, which is that we have to be busy to be successful. That we can stop for a moment and sit at your feet. Sit at your feet and learn and grow from the teacher of all teachers, the master of all masters, the king of all kings. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, right where we belong. In Jesus' name, amen.